And the second topic today, uh, I think we should be able to cover this today. Uh, this will be the interpretation of probability and Bayes rule. So I think some of you probably have heard about Bayes rule in the past and also the way that Bayesian think about probability. Uh, so this uh, short section here will just formally introduce them and uh, talk about some of the differences and similarities between how the frequentist or this classical inference thinking about probability. So to motivate Bayesian inference, um, again, uh, the things that you probably have heard in the past, for example, significance tests or hypothesis tests, and also confidence intervals, they are actually forms of classical or what people also call frequentist inference. Okay? So um, sometimes they might not be um, in, um, adequate. So I'm just going to give you a toy example over here. Suppose you flip a coin, you don't know the probability of heads uh, three times and get tails all three times, meaning that you don't know the success probability of P. Okay, usually we use P to uh, for that um, parameter in this case. So the sample percentage, uh, which uh, maybe use p hat or whatever the notation that you use, uh, in this case, because you threw a uh, flip it three times and all of them are tells, meaning that you don't get any success out of the three trials. So the sample percentage of that p will be a um, zero value. Uh, but this cannot be an accurate estimate of the true percentage of the heads because again, it might just be chance that you didn't get any head in your three, uh, three trials. But if you are attempting to use the, uh, the regular uh, inference for proportion, if you know when you try to uh, do inference for proportion, you have the central limit theorem kicks in, when you have um, the condition satisfied and everything. Uh, but even if so, even if you're using that in that case, uh, because you have a sample percentage of zero uh, for your P over there, uh, you won't get any further about how to really get an accurate estimate of the true percentage of heads. So again, this is extreme uh, case because you don't have a large sample. Here we only have a sample of three trials or three flips, and that is usually one important drawback of using classical inference or frequentist inference because you will really need a large sample size for all of the methodology over there to hold. Uh, however, uh, from Bayesian point of view, um, we might be able to deal with the small sample size issue, and we'll see this in action uh, today as well as later in the semester. Uh, but one important concept I want to introduce here is what we call a priori or a prior. That is your belief about the unknown parameter, which is P, the success probability here, uh, of the flipping coin. You might have an idea before um, you even uh, do any kind of experiments, and we call that what we call the prior distribution. Later, we're going to define distribution, but now just think about them as prior probability. And if you believe um, the true percentage, or I should say, if you believe the coin is fair, you're probably going to have a prior belief of that unknown probability P to be 50%, okay, instead of um, like a 0 0.0 or 0 0.9 or something. Okay, so um, this is one, like I said, pretty extreme um, example. Uh, because you have small sample size and you have a sample percentage of zero and you have nothing else to do to do the inference from the frequentist point of view. Um, but um, it could happen in practice because small sample size actually is pretty commonly now. Uh, well, we talk about big data, but sometimes you do, do not get a large uh, sample. For example, when you do um, test with experiments for like drug and effectiveness and all that, a lot of time you don't have a large sample size to begin with. And then sometimes um, this won't be adequate enough when you're doing classical inference. So this is one motivation uh, that why we want to think about um, Bayesian inference in particular. And Bayesian inference itself, uh, as you will see, uh, provides a formal method for quantifying and incorporating our prior beliefs into inference. So you will see that, well, you might have an idea about the parameter before you collect the data, and then you collect your data from your model, and then you're able to update your belief from the prior to what we call the posterior. So you're able to incorporate your own belief if they're accurate and useful to use, as well as what the data convey to finally sharpen what you believe about, about the parameter um, taken together of the two pieces of information. So um, the long history, actually um, Bayesian or Bayes itself is named after the 18th century um, mathematician Thomas Bayes. Okay, so that's his last name. So uh, people use Bayes or Bayesian to refer to this particular school of um, doing um, inference and statistics. 
Uh, there are three, I would say, uh, general uh, concepts or general um, building blocks. You have the modeling, where we try to incorporate prior belief or domain expert, expert knowledge. And also in terms of theoretical aspect, uh, like I said, it doesn't need large sample assumption. Like when, when you only flip a coin three times, you are able to make inference about that uh, probability, success probability uh, using Bayesian inference, uh, even if you get all of them a failure, okay? So that is what we mean by it doesn't need large sample assumption. Uh, but one caveat I will add is uh, when you do have large sample and say for a particular regression analysis you wanna do, if you are doing it from the Bayesian perspective and if you're doing it from the frequentist perspective, uh, if you, yeah, as long as you have large sample size, I think when certain conditions are met, the two approaches gonna arrive at similar answer. Okay, so that's another attractiveness of doing Bayesian as well is that it's not coming out of nowhere. Uh, you, you can uh, deal with large sample um, situation. And if you do, they're usually going to coincide with what you're going to get from a classical or uh, uh, frequentist inference. But if you do have small sample size, then Bayesian methods will really outperform in many cases. Uh, lastly, computational. Uh, we will introduce more formally later when we get to Bayesian computing of this Markov chain multi but that's the main uh, te uh, technique of doing uh, Bayesian inference when you have more complicated models. And I will also mention that these approaches are largely, largely popularized by uh, advancing computational technology during the last 25 to 30 years. And uh, the Gibbs sampler, which is one of the algorithms we're going to introduce, actually was proposed and uh, in early the night in the early '90s. In fact, when we get to um, that section, I will also um, ask all of us to read a research paper, a short accessible research paper about it, and we'll have some discussions as well as a lab designed around implementing some of the methods in in that paper. So in terms of probability, okay, think about how to understand probability. Uh, let, let's also talk about the two schools of statistics, the frequentist classical versus the Bayesian. Uh, from the frequentist point of view, um, if you took um, Math 241 on campus or elsewhere for a remote student, you will know that uh, when we talk about probability, we're really thinking about the long run relative frequencies of repeatable events. So if I have an event A, okay, and I want to know the probability of event A, so it's PA. What that really means is that if I'm able to repeat um, the events uh, for a large number of times, okay? So N, that's the, the number of um, times that you're able to repeat events. And uh, the cardinality of A, uh, which is in the um, numerator, uh, uh, numerator at this point over here, um, that is showing you the number of times that A happens among all of the repeatable events. Okay, so, and you will see that we take a limit, we take the limit as N goes up to infinity. So what this means is that the probability what we're doing is really thinking about if you are able to repeat experiment for a super large number of times, then the number of times that A event happens will give you a sense of the probability of A. So for example, when we are doing flipping a coin experiment, okay, so that's um, uh, typical. Sorry, I just saw a, a, mo a yeah, note. Yes, um, so the slides I will post them right after class. Um, so, but in the future, I will also post them beforehand. Just today is a little bit um, different. I was making final edits, but I will post them right after class. And um, for, for that matter, we will see that um, when you have large uh, enough times when you're flipping the coin, and then if it's a fair coin, then if you define event A to be getting ahead, then if it's a fail coin, when we think about a fair coin, we're really thinking about the long-term relative frequencies of getting heads gonna be 50%. Okay? If it's a unfair coin of only turning out 30% of the time, then, um, then that's what this event A is and also what the PA is. Um, so like I said, we already saw the toy example earlier. If you only have one occurrence of one thing, one time, um, how would that help us understand the probability? And also if maybe not only one time, but three times, for example, and how that can help us understand probability uh, could be a little bit hard just because um, if you get all of them as heads, as in our example, of three, uh, three flips, um, that doesn't really tell us that the long-term or the long run probability is zero, um, but rather it's just really saying that you haven't done the run, the flipping long enough. Okay. So I just want to mention that the 
classical conventional thinking of probability is really building based on the assumption that you're able to repeat experiments for a large number of times. And that might not be feasible in many cases. And um, Bayesian method is one way around it um, to, to figure out the understanding. So then speaking of Bayesian school of statistics or thinking about probability, it is more of a subjective degree or of belief. Okay, so for example, I'm still having this A event and two people could have differing probabilities. If we still use the example of flipping a coin, one of you might think, okay, it's 30% of getting had. So PA is 30%. One of you might think it's a fair coin. So PA is 50% or 80% for another person. Um, so many people can have differing probabilities. And then more importantly, the probability of your belief of a certain event or certain hypothesis is going to change as new information slash data arise according to Bayes rule. So the Bayes rule is really a conditional probability statement. Okay, so you can see over here, the probability of A given B uh, equals to um, the joint probability of A and B over the marginal probability of B. And the joint probability of A and B can be written as, as you can see over here, I almost forget that I can use my, my Apple pencil as well. Sorry about that. So here, let me, make it okay yeah mm -hmm. okay yeah i cannot make it maybe a little bit thicker but hopefully yeah so okay so the conditional probability of a given b is the joint of a and b over probability of b okay so that's the marginal and then furthermore the joint can be written on the other way of getting the condition of B given A times PA over the probability of B. Okay, so this is probably the way that in the past you have learned about um, conditional probability and Bayes rule itself. Uh, so what we want to say is, well, I have a particular belief about A and think about B as my data. Okay, so I start with the prior belief that I don't see a data, I don't have a model, but I have a certain belief about um, the probability of event A. And now I get data, so I should be able to update my belief about A in light of the data. So that's why we write this as a conditional probability of A given B. And then you can use Bayes rule, this general rule over here, to do the calculation in order to calculate um, the update belief about your A given B. So we'll see a toy example coming up as well. Uh, but all of the Bayesian methods that we're going to cover in this class, all stemming from the Bayes rule itself, is that you have a prior relief or prior distribution once we get to that about certain parameter. And then you collect data, you have your model, and then the new data going to help you sharpen your belief about, about the parameter or the hypothesis. And then you do the sharpening process by uh, the Bayesian updates using the Bayes rule. All right. So let's think about example first. And I will also invite you back to the breakout room. A study on several different but similar populations, let's just say you have several different but very similar populations. For each of which you need an estimate of variability. So you can think about this as the standard deviation estimation, okay? And how should one use the important prior information that the populations are similar? Okay, so this question might be a little bit vague, but let me talk about it a little bit, and then you can think about it a little bit, and I'll invite you back to the breakout room. So the question is, let's just say I have several different populations. They are different, but I know they are similar. And I want to estimate the standard, let's just say standard deviation of the mean, let's just say. How should we use the important prior information, which the prior information is that I know they're different, but they're similar. In order, to, um, in order to make good inference and have a good understanding about the estimate of, problem, uh, of the variability. Okay. So with that in mind, I know this is a little bit hard because uh, you won't be able to see the question, but I will try to copy and paste the question once I invite you back to the breakout room. Um, but the question is trying to figure out how you can use prior information that the populations are similar if you're doing some kind of inference like this. So with that in all right, so like I said, the goal is we have, uh, we want to get variance estimation of different um, populations, but similar. So 
if you are trying to use the information that I know the populations are similar, uh, it might not be as straightforward uh, in the frequentist or classical inference because if you have different populations, what you can do is either you treat each population separately, individually, and then get a variance, or you put all of the populations together into a big superpopulation and then get a variance estimate that way. Okay, so either you don't have any information um, about, you know, you won't be able to use information across different populations knowing that they are similar to each other. So that's what I mean by uh, you have to do separate estimates of variance. If you do that, you don't use that information that they are similar to each other. Or if you try to use the information that are similar to each other, you're going to put the entire uh, population of all of the different populations, um, then you won't be able to uh, have a different uh, estimation across the different groups. Okay. Um, however, from the Bayesian point of view, uh, you can use what we call hierarchical modeling later. Um, so you're able to use the same prior distribution for all of the variances, and you can allow much more efficient use of such prior information. So again, this question might be a little bit vague, um, but I just want to show you that sometimes you have important what we call prior information about uh, the samples or expert domain knowledge, et cetera, et cetera, that you might want to incorporate into your inference process. Uh, the classical inference might not be as straightforward, um, but the, in Bayesian way, it could be a lot more straightforward. And we will see examples like this coming up. Another example, this is a good review, I think, for many of you as well. Um, so we know that the confidence interval, let's just say, um, we have a 95% confidence interval of unknown parameter theta. I want you to um, go back to the breakout room, talk to your um, breakout room members as well, just to make sure that, well, you know how to interpret um, a 95% confidence interval. And I also want you to maybe think about, is that an interval that has probably of 95% containing the parameter or is something else? Okay, so with that in mind. Okay, welcome back. Um, Anyone wants to give a try of this question? How would you usually interpret a 95% confidence interval? And is it an interval that has probability of 95% of containing the true parameter? Anyone? Uh, sorry, I think my, my group got in a little late. Could you repeat the question? Oh yeah, sure. Uh, so the question is, is anyone is willing to share your thoughts about the question itself? Uh, since you asked, do you mind sharing what you think? Yeah, sure. Um, so uh, one thing we discussed was, well, that in fact the parameter um, has a, like a real correspondence with the world. And so when we're saying that we have like 95% confidence, um, that this parameter will fall within some interval. Um, we're not saying that if we run the experiment like uh, you know, thousands and thousands of times, we'll find that 95% of cases it is and 5% of cases it's not. Um, rather, we're expressing something subjective about our credence um, in where this parameter lies as opposed to actually um, a fact about the world. Um, and then I guess the second thing we thought is that, um, oh yeah, the second thing we thought is that I guess I'm not exactly sure how this relates, um, but if we're saying that we were like 95% confident that this parameter falls within this, this, uh, um, this interval, then I think that we are totally eliding any conception of model uncertainty, right? We're saying that we're 100% confident that our model is describing the phenomena properly where, where it possibly isn't. Um, and so if our model suggests that there's like a 95%, uh, or we, if our model gives us 95% credence in some interval, um, but we're only 50% confident in our model itself, then our like all things considered credence ought to be lower. Um, so those are, those are two thoughts. Yeah, thanks for sharing. Yeah, and um, sure. So I think first of all, the first part, I think what Koji was uh, sharing definitely uh, makes sense. Uh, we wanted to make sure that we, when we interpret a confidence interval, let's say a 95% confidence interval, we are 95% confident that um, the unknown parameter is going to fall into whatever the interval that you can calculate. And indeed, uh, this 95% uh, confidence itself is coming from the fact that if we were able to repeat right, the experiment for a large number of times, 
And every time you get a 95% confidence interval, then about 95% of all of the confidence intervals that you get are gonna cover the truth. And then the remaining 5% uh, wouldn't cover the truth. So that's what usually 95% confidence uh, interval mean. And then of course the sharing also touches upon, well, what is the confidence you have for the model? So I think um, that will be uh, beyond the current discussion itself, but definitely something important to, to keep in mind. And for, for us, the important takeaway here is that, well, we know how to interpret the 95% confidence interval, but also make sure that it does not equivalent, is not equivalent to an interval that has a 95% probability of containing uh, theta, okay? So uh, you might think, well, the second one is probably pretty intuitive. And indeed, that is actually the way that Bayesian thinks about uh, the unknown parameter and any kind of interval you're gonna come up with. Um, so later you're going to learn something we don't call a confidence interval anymore, we call credible interval. So if you have a 95% Bayesian credible interval, that is actually di directly related to the probability of the hypothesis. So for example, if I have a 95% credible interval of theta, let's just say from one to three, then I have a 95% posterior probability that this interval is going to contain my theta. Okay, so this is the opposite to what people usually think about the frequentist. And uh, again, the frequentist one might not be the most intuitive. It might be one of the hardest questions or topics people try to understand in the intro stack course. And even so, beyond that, people make mistakes all the time. And um, so I just want to mention that uh, this example, again, uh, try to contrast the frequentist and the Bayesian thinking about probability as well as about inference when you go to that point. Um, so with related to that example too, I just want to also mention two um, aspects. Uh, one thing is, well, what is the best way of quantifying uncertainty? Uh, and the second one is more pra uh, pragmatic in a sense that, well, how users or laymen will interpret statistical conclusions. Like I said, the, this is confidence interval is one, p-value is another one that makes it very hard for people to intuitively grapple what they really mean. Um, so for us, uh, we are introducing another way to think about all of these problems, think about uncertainty, think about uh, how to make conclusions. So that's from the Bayesian point of view, and then that will be uh, the core throughout the semester. Um, also, a couple of remarks, because I think not everybody has taken a mathematical statistics or a classical inference course. I know everybody needs to take an intro stack to come in, but other than that, uh, maybe not so much beyond uh, why, like say, a normal model is a good model to use. In that case, why 95% confidence level? It is what it is. Um, so in this course, we won't emphasize too much on the differences beyond today. Uh, today is really just motivated and motivation, but beyond today, I won't try to make the difference and comparison between the two. But I think uh, many of you, because of your prior experience, if you want, like I said earlier, one of the, um, uh, uh, one of the example um, projects that I shared is actually contrasting the Bayesian logistic regression or regular logistic regression, okay? So feel free to explore, especially in the form of a project, if that's what interests you, uh, of comparing and distincting between the two approaches. Uh, but for most of us in the course, we're going to think like a Bayesian for the entire semester. And um, like I said, feel free to start a conversation, um, incorporate that, the comparison and the thinking into other forms, for example, the project. Okay. Um, so uh, before we end today, I just want to uh, start the toy example. And then Friday, when we come back, I will show the toy example is actually a real calculation example. Um, of how to do Bayesian inference for a simple problem. Uh, but I want to show you the general procedure of doing a Bayesian inference um, how, how in, in practice. So the goal is to make inference for unknown quantity, like just like the theta thing, or you can think about the probability of the hypothesis, which is unknown and you're trying to get an understanding of it. So the procedure itself is we will come up with what we call a prior probability. So if I'm interested about learning the probability of a hypothesis, before seeing any data, I have no idea about, let's say, let's just say the coin flipping example. If I have no idea, my best guess maybe that it is a fair coin. Okay, so I'm going to assign 50% for, for, for coming up with a head. But of course, if somebody told you that, oh, I tried with this coin like 100 times previously, I only get 30% chance of getting the head, then that's what we call like expert knowledge. Somebody already worked on this before. And if you trust them, you might want to use probably of 30 percent instead of 50 percent but anyway that's a subjective idea like what we saw a subjective belief and that's before seeing the data and the second step of doing Bayesian inference is that you're going to collect the data 
okay, whatever data you need, like flipping coin and all that. And you also, together with the, with the data, there will be a model that you're gonna use. So we're gonna talk about a possible model and possible models uh, later on as well. But keep in mind that you not only collect the data, but also you have a model about the data itself, how the data is related to the parameter of interest. And then after collecting it, you're gonna update your prior belief uh, um, given the, or you're gonna update the hypothesis of the prob probability of the hypothesis given the data you just observed, and we call it the posterior probability. So you see that for the prior, it's just a marginal distribution, marginal probability. But then when you're going into the posterior case, it's gonna be conditional of hypothesis given the data and the model that you come up with. Okay, so this is a general procedure, uh, maybe sound vague at this point, but we'll see in example and throughout the semester how this plays out in, in, a, in any kind of applied problem. And the last comment I will make is that the frequency is p-value, which is what I mentioned earlier, is another thing that is uh, quite unintuitive in many cases because it is actually the probability of, given that the null hypothesis is true, you're looking at the probability of your data. Okay, so it's the reversed. Okay, so for posterior probability is you have your data given that, what is your belief now about your hypothesis, whereas the frequentist p-value is the other way around, is that if the null hypothesis is true, what's the probability of see something as extreme as my data? Okay, so that's another reason in many ways, it might not be as intuitive as we hope it could be. And that's why a lot of times people make mistakes about uh, comments about p-value and all that. Okay, anyway, nothing is uh, like better or worse. It's really just about different schools of thinking and different ways of understanding uncertainty and problems. Um, so again, welcome to the class. And uh, throughout the semester, we're gonna learn how different ways of understanding probability, how to build up models in different uh, contexts. And then most importantly, also how to do the modeling itself through modern scientific computing. All right, um, so I think I'm already one minute over. So uh, good to see everyone and hope to see, uh, yeah, most of the master students starting next week in person. And then on Friday, I will still see everyone uh, on Zoom, hopefully. And then next week, um, yeah, we'll go from there. All right, y'all take care. Thank you for coming. Thank you. Enjoy the rest of your week. Thank you. Bye-bye. Thanks. Thank you. Bye-bye.